Hi, I'm Dan Robinson with the Great Lakes Spirituality Project, and I am very happy to be talking with Holly Bird today. Welcome, Holly. Thank you so much. I'm glad you're here. Thanks for making the time. Um, Holly is of San Felipe Pueblo, Apache, Yaqui, Pere Pucha, and European descent, and has a long history of community activism in both environmental and indigenous issues. As a lawyer in private practice in Traverse City, Michigan, she, has a, she was appointed as an acting chief judge and associate judge for the Grand Traverse Band of Ottawa and Chippewa Indians, serving from 2008 to 2011. And then in 2010, she was appointed to serve as an associate Supreme Court judge for the Nottawasepi Huron Band of Potawatomi Indians and continues in that capacity today. Holly served as co-executive director for the Water Protectors Legal Collective, the leading legal service at the No Dapple Camp protest in support of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. She was the collective's civil ground coordinator at the No Dapple Camp and has also served as a board member. She also founded and serves as the executive director for the Michigan Water Protectors Legal Task Force, a project of the National Lawyers Guild. She currently serves as co-executive director for the Title Track, a Michigan nonprofit dedicated to clean water, racial equity, and youth empowerment. And on top of all that, she's a published author of articles involving Native American law and indigenous rights that are quoted regularly by the U.S. Office of Civil Rights. And she's provided statewide trainings on indigenous child welfare and native issues for the state of Michigan. We were just talking before we started the interview about that's a lot. You got a lot going on. I'm my mother's daughter. <laughs> She's a very busy woman, and I, I guess I've continued the trend. I guess I should mention I also have three children and I'm married. <laughs> oh well, see that's a, those are full time yeah. jobs in and of themselves. I know from yeah. personal experience. <laughs> but you know, I, I always say they inspire me to do the work that I do. So. Um, the the fact that they're here is what makes me and keeps me so productive well that's great yeah i i, I have a, a brand new grandson myself and so that um that is part of the motivation isn't it yeah congratulations well thank you thank you um so let's start a little bit with just talking about water in general could could you describe your uh how you understand your connection to water and your work as a water protector so as an indigenous woman um it is part of our responsibility and our role to help care for that, for the water and our relationship with the water. And so um, I take that responsibility very seriously. And that's, um, that's something that, you know, I'm just born with by virtue of, of gender. And um, growing up on the Great Lakes obviously has influenced that as well. Um, I've, I've been so fortunate to live, you know, on some of the world's largest areas of, of freshwater in, in the world. And I am never, um, I never take it for granted. It's, it's so beautiful and I know how rare that is. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, I've been to other places in the world where um, even where, you know, some of my traditional people are from where it's really dry and dusty and, and um, you know, the rivers that flow through those areas are, are just not as accessible, um, not as clean sometimes. Um, and, and definitely not what we see here. Um, and with the, with the advent of climate change um, and, and with all of the things that we see happening around water, um, it just inspires me to action. I mean, we all have children and, and when we think about the quality of life that we all want to have, um, you know, we think seven generations ahead and, and we go, wow, at this point, you know, will any of our our seventh generation have be able to use this water or have access to it, um, much less our own children right now, you know, with climate change coming so quickly. Um, so I can't not be a water protector. You know, I can't not do this work because it is so important. Yeah. Um, you, you talked about being in that role to some degree by, by virtue of your gender. And for folks that aren't familiar with, um, indigenous cultures where women are seen as the, the protectors of water. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, it, it goes into a, a faith, right? And a, and a cultural knowledge of that relationship. Um, we're the ones that, that um, create life. We have a sort of that direct connection with the creation spirit. 
And so much of our lives are invested in with the giving and taking of water, whether it's through the birthing process where we're all bathing, you know, we're bathing our, our young ones in, in the water of our wombs to um, gathering water, to um, cooking with water, bathing with water. I mean, all of it. Um, we know how precious it, precious it is and, and how much we use it. Um, quite often, we're also the, the nurturers of, of gardens or of farms. And so, um, you know, if anybody's ever grown up in, a, in an area where water is um, either rationed or is subject to droughts or famines, I mean, we know it's, it's um, absolutely necessary for life. And us being, you know, almost 93% water or something within our, with our own bodies, um, it only makes sense. It's, it's really common sense, you know, but by virtue of, of our gender, I think we, we see that, um, that reach and that connection um, as it flows through ourselves. Sure. Um, you you kind of alluded to this in the beginning of your answer to that question, but and, and language is a funny thing because it kind of limits us when we put a label on something. So I know in 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 some indigenous indigenous cultures, this is sort of an artificial divide. But to use the word spiritual, would you describe your connection to water as as, as spiritual? Absolutely. Um, one of the one of the basic tenets of indigenous spirituality is our acknowledgement of the spirit of all things around us, not just ourselves. Um, we acknowledge that the creator made everything and in everything there is a spirit of some kind. So when we talk about recognizing that spirit of water, working with that spirit of water as a, as a spiritual connection, um, that's recognizing the sacredness of everything, you know, that, and that we're all part of that. So it's really important that we recognize that we're not separate from it. You know, I, one of the things I always like to say um, to people who kind of have a mindset, there's, there is a, a mindset amongst many, and, and some of it is um, faith-based, that uh, they are separate from the earth in a way, like they are stewards of the earth, owners of the earth, rather than um, interconnected with the earth. Um, there's a separation of us from the animals, so to speak. And um, our people think that's insane <laughs> because we are so directly connected. And, and the one way that I think it's best to explain that is, um, you know, the water can live without us. The water can exist in perfect harmony with itself and all of creation without us. But we can't live without it. Mm -hmm. Right. So what does that tell you about the relationship we should be having with the water? <laughs> it's, it's really one of pure dependence and subsistence. And so um, our respect for the water and for the spirit of the water should, should recognize that. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, that's where we run into problems. If you don't, then, um, you know, that water, that relationship with water becomes soured and, and it becomes uh, not available to us anymore. Well, it, it, it's, it's really good to hear you say that. And I, and I'm thinking back to this interview that I, that you did recently that I listened to, you talked about the healing properties of water and that you need to have, in order to be healed, you need to have a good relationship with water. So say a little bit more if you would about that idea of healing. Well, I think that, you know, given the, the composition of our own bodies, you know, as, as being the majority being water, um, it, it makes complete sense that water, um, clean water, healthy water would be healing for things that, um, that ail us, right? Mm -hmm. um, I've, I've seen some actually pretty amazing things. Um, some people might call them spirit healings or, or faith-based healings um, in connection with water. And, you know, I can't really share those here because those, those are other people's experiences. But um, I believe that, um, yes, having a really good relationship with water, um, coming to water with the, with the respect and understanding of our relationship and what that means is, um, is healing in itself. And so that like with, with my work, that's one of the things that we do with children is try to help reintroduce them to that relationship. Um, for example, when with Title Track, we did a program called River Quest, 
and we met with the youth um, in Flint, where you know a lot of youth have a, a really damaged relationship with water, um, not not just because you know people in their family had gotten sick with it um, because of the lead pipes and whatnot, but also because of the way it's it's handled, you know, in their own community, it's it's hard to to be near a source of water that's fresh and and clean. Um, it, often it's polluted or it looks bad, and and they don't go near it, right? So um, that was one of the things that we sought to to help and reestablish with children because without that um, beneficial relationship or understanding of water, um, that disease of water and disease within water, within ourselves is only gonna continue sure. and, and probably get worse. So um, kids naturally understand this though, which is, which is a beautiful thing when they, you know, if you've ever watched the simple thing of a child taking a bath or being in a swimming pool, the joy that they get from interacting with clean water is, is healing in itself. You know, they, it, it can bring them joy. It can, um, relax them. And all of these things are absolutely essential for a healthy body. Yeah. My grandson has a small water table in his backyard that he plays with. And it's fun to watch him interact with that water. It's just, it's such a new discovery. And you're kind of like, wow, this really is a cool thing. I mean, the water is just amazing. You know? Right. And, and, and as well to, to teach them respect for the water. I, I can't think of anything more important, especially living on the Great Lakes. Um, you know, water is, um, is not always uh, timid, <laughs> as we might say, water also takes. Mm -hmm. And um, we see this all every summer here, you know, we'll, we'll have unfortunate people that drowned or are taken out by a, a riptide. And uh, we have to remind them, look, it's, it is nothing to fool around with either. It's one of the most powerful forces on earth. Right. Yeah. So it's um, that part of that respect goes there too. Sure. So let, let's, let's take all that is a kind of a setting the context. Let's talk about some practice, some specific situations. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, your experience and your role out at Standing Rock in the fight against the Dakota Access Pipeline? Absolutely. I, um, I first heard about Standing Rock, believe it or not, through Facebook. Um, and you know, for me initially, because I'd heard a little bit about it kind of here and there, we, you know, in the, when you're in the native community and you're doing the kind of work that I do, whether it's law or um, something, something else, just native rights, you hear about all these incidents happen. And, and usually there's so many of them happening, like it, I'll just be like, okay, there's another one, you know, and I'll, I'll think about it and kind of put it on my radar. But I'm not always able to just, you know, jump up and go over there or do something like that. And, and sometimes we need to be invited too. So um, when Standing Rock happened, you know, I heard about it uh, through some channels and just kind of went, oh, okay, it's another one, you know, and, and you kind of feel a little tired because in our community, it, it's happening all the time. But um, the, uh, the thing that really struck me was the the day that the dog bites happened. I call it the day of the dog bites mm. when water protectors were attacked by dogs from one of the private security firms that were so quote unquote protecting the pipeline. And this happened over a weekend where um, the litigation was already in place to um, from the Standing Rock Sioux tribe to try to keep them from putting the pipeline through their lands. And one of the things that they were required to do in the litigation was to identify the areas of cultural concern. And in specific, there were a bunch of areas that were ceremonial mm -hmm. um, or where there were people buried and, and artifacts. And so they, no sooner had they just done that that week. Um, and then there was like a, a holiday weekend that very weekend um, Dapple took that that information and they plowed over that whole area with bulldozers. Wow. And in an attempt to to hide or disturb those areas so they couldn't be used as a as an excuse anymore. And that was what the the protesters were observing. You know, they were they were running over to protect their their loved ones, you know, their their buried relatives. And um, that's when the dog bites occur. And, and one of my friends um, 
who has since passed, uh, Myron Dewey, who is with Digital Smoke Signals, was filming this. And um, I was just floored. You know, this was uh, the people of the Ocheti Shikoin, um, and roughly that's, you know, a lot of the bands of Lakota and Dakota from that area. Um, one of my son's unchis or, or grandmother was from there. And so that was the first thing I was like, oh my gosh, look what they're doing to my, to Unchi's people, you know, and I literally couldn't sleep. Like I, I just cry, I cried for a couple of days <laughs> and I was just like, I couldn't believe it. I was so upset and so just pissed off. Mm-hmm. And, um, I remember turning to my husband who was uh, newly on council for the Grand Traverse band and saying, are you guys going to get something together, like a delegation or anything. Cause you know, if you're not, I'm just going to go, <laughs> like, I'm just going to go. And he was like, Oh wait, just give me a week or so. And um, so they actually had gotten a, a delegation together and we traveled with their band of elders and cultural um, people and brought a bunch of donations. We actually brought one of the largest donations that they had, you know, oh, to standing awesome. rock as well as supplies and, um, ceremonial items and things like that and that was where you know that was how I first got there and I traveled with my 13 year old son and my husband and um right away went and volunteered at the legal tent because I knew that that's what needed to be done and um that was it as soon as we got home I think we were there a week and as soon as I got home I was already trying to figure out when to go back Mm -hmm. so that was it. I, I went back and I was hired in as um, one of the ground coordinators who, who were essentially like the executive directors um, in camp. And I went back that um, at the end of November of 2016. So after that, I was, I was there for two weeks out of every month and kind of going back and forth and otherwise was on Zoom, you know, <laughs> the other seven or 10 hours of each day when I was gone. Um, but yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was something I felt compelled to do, not only to protect the water of that place, um, but also just out of pure, um, protecting my relatives, Sure. you know, that, that was, um, the, my primary focus at that point. So let's talk a little bit about, I mean, what, what was your, from a personal standpoint, I guess, what was the impact? For, for those that aren't familiar with with this fight, I mean, this is this is a gathering of folks from all over the world, but especially indigenous people fighting an oil pipeline going the, with the potential of t- contaminating the water supply mm-hmm. for the Standing Rock tribe in the river there and, and fouling the, the land and the air water. Um, what was your personal take? I mean, your experience, what impact did it have on you, I guess? It, being a part of this it was pivotal for me it really was um, I you know I had been an activist almost all my life whether it was environmental you know canvassing for water when I was in in college or um, you know working with my people on other things I'd, I'd working on mascot issues or on on religious freedom issues whatever it was but this was this was something different um, one of the things that really impacted me about Standing Rock and and just to to summarize it, I would say it was a foreign oil, com- you know, corporation that was um, trying to bring a pipeline through the Missouri River, and had originally been slated to do it in Bismarck, which is a predominantly white farming community. Mm-hmm. And the residents of Bismarck had one town hall meeting where they said, "Oh, we don't want that through our water," and so they went, you know, one mile above the only source of drinking water for the entire Standing Rock Sioux tribe, which is a very large tribal area. And so with that, not only were they threatening their only source of drinking water, but, you know, there there are farmers and all kinds of people downriver from that that aren't just tribal. Um, So it was, you know, they were going through, um, by eminent domain, going through people's backyards, going through, there was one lady who was a whose parents had had a farm, you know, for generations. And this pipeline actually went between her house and the barn. And it was illegal for her to, to cross that in, in, in any sort of a way that she could have done it before. It was, it, there were, it was just insane. She had to find like a special crossing for it. 
And so, um, I mean, this, they were bullies, pure and simple and, and state sanctioned, unfortunately. So for me, um, not only was I like, I, who, who would believe this is happening, right? We also know that from the man camps that happened with the building of the pipeline, um, whether it was in Montana or um, North Dakota or some of these other areas where they had already come, that there was a huge uptick in violence against um, women and children um, who were tribal and um, kind of helped shed the spotlight on our epidemic of missing murdered indigenous women. And um, so that was another thing because none of the, the areas that had that pipeline or those man cap camps arriving had the police force you know, to um, take care of that. And so um, the, the uptick in cases, I think one of the, one tribe saw like a 25% uptick in, in drug and violent crime cases from the man camps. So um, kind of with all of that there, um, and then going and seeing this camp, um, it, was, it was amazing to me that this was being allowed to happen. And, and um, just confounding, I just couldn't believe it. But the other, the other part of that, um, I don't wanna say it was all bad because uh, there were some beautiful things too. Like one of the first things I saw um, when I got into camp after passing several National Guard checkpoints, mind mm. you. I mean, who, who has to like go through checkpoints just to get into a camp where there's a bunch of people who don't have any kind of weaponry or property that they're destroying? I mean, it was literally in the middle of nowhere. Um, but this is how they got treated. 33 law enforcement agencies came to subdue this crowd that was unarmed. <laughs> and, and praying in a field, you know, it was, it was absolutely crazy. But um, one of the most beautiful things I saw was as I drove into camp, you could see for about, you know, uh, maybe less than a quarter of a mile where camp started and where the entrance gates were, just this entire valley of teepees and, and tents and, you know, um, all of these people that were together. And then you went down what we called Flag Row which was the, the road that went into camp. And you would see the flags of all of the hundreds and hundreds of Indian nations, um, plus a bunch from out, you know, all over the world uh, that yeah. were there in support. And so it was, it was the largest gathering of um, indigenous people for a, for a cause, you know, kind of uniting together. And that literally, I mean, I remember traveling in with that and literally being in tears seeing that. And, and the elders that were with us were in tears. I mean, we all were just floored by um, how people came together to support that. It was really beautiful. Yeah. Well, you talked about it being pivotal for you. And how was that, how was that pivotal? Well, uh, I think for me, it was, um, not only did it reignite that fire that I had, you know, for my community and my people, sometimes we get, we get bogged down in living, right. And surviving every day, whether it's having children and, and raising them or having a law career and, you know, trying to do the work you have to do. <coughs> it was, um, it really made that stop for me, you know, like, and I could see within that, um, that event, for one, you could see a certain way of living that was um, that was sort of hinted at in camp, that was simpler, that was based on cultural values, and um, was about people taking care of each other. And that was really beautiful, you know, glimpsing that and being homesick for that old way of life that our people have have experienced, um, and remembering that collectively. It was that was really beautiful. Um, but at the same time, it, it also, for me as an attorney, <coughs> you know, and I'm, I tend to be like an idealistic attorney, right? I, I went into the law to, to try to help and change things, um, to help change the system if I could, um, so that it was fair and more equitable for everyone. And, um, and, and that's not to say I wasn't aware that um, law enforcement could be crooked or that they could use their powers for um, things that that didn't seem to connect with their power to protect and serve. Um, 
but to see 33 law enforcement agencies there trying to inf- protect a, a pipeline, an oil, a foreign, you know, oil corporation against unarmed innocent people, you know, that were that were trying to protect their their water, just their ability to to live was astounding. And um it really that really hurt, you know, that really hurt me as a uh, as a professional because I I really had to go, whoa, hmm. you know, I had I had so much more faith in in um the people in these professions you know, than, than I do now. Now I, I, I still try, you know, on an individual level to, to be discerning that way. Um, but that was the first time I saw it in a, in a more broader systemic way um, where it wasn't, where it wasn't just couched in our 1960s. Um, you know, this is what happened then or in the seventies, even with the, with the riots in Detroit or, um, you know, some of the other civil rights movements that we've had, this was, this was an action and it was, it, it was live and it was against my people. And um, it, it really um, sparked a fire for me to, to continue working to do that stuff and, and to also continue working for the water. It, it, um, it, but it was also very traumatic. I mean, there was a lot of stuff I saw and as, as the person who, I had to review a lot of the videotapes that were taken, review the evidence. I, I was out taking pictures of blood, you know, in the snow uh, where someone was shot by, um, by law enforcement, you know, things like that. So um, that it was very traumatic in that way too. So I had to, I had to learn how to heal after a while and give myself some reprieves from, from looking at stuff every once in a while, but also knowing that we couldn't stop. You know, it wasn't, um, we're, we're born into this, so it's not something we can just stand down from. Sure. So, um, and then I go back home and look at my children and, and know that this is for them too. Sure. Yeah. Well, let, let's talk about that, a little bit of that back home, because I'm, I'm wondering what, what for you was the significance, uh, significance of what happened at Standing Rock for some of the water protection efforts that we're facing in the Great Lakes Basin? I'm thinking of, you know, particularly, for example, Enbridge's Line 5. It's, mm-hmm. you know, it's right now it runs through the Bad River Band of Lake Superior Chippewa Indians and the Bay Mills Indian Community Reservations in Ceded Territory in Wisconsin and Michigan and along the lake bottom at the Straits of Mackinac, some very important and sensitive places. Um, what do you think Standing Rock has to say, say for that, that water protection effort? Well, uh, the one thing I, I do want to note is that you know, all of these water protection efforts, whether they're indigenous or otherwise, have been going on for a long time. And um, I know this because I was doing some of it when I was younger. Um, and it, and it some of it was area specific and some of it wasn't, you know, and some of it was just more generalized. But um, Standing Rock was was amazing because now we have the power of social media, <laughs> you know, and we we actually were able to put our own stuff out there to get awareness and to draw in supporters um, for the water movement. That's something we really didn't have before. You know, it, it, it really changed the game in this. So with all of that, you get support, you get more bodies. um, And it it also changed the way, for example, the court system had to do things in, in Mm. North Dakota. So, um, and, and we've seen that some uh, legislatures have also been inspired to create new laws um, trying to quell protesters, you know, and, and out of fear of what was going on in Standing Rock. And I'm not really sure what that fear is because it, like I said, they weren't destroying anything. Um, nobody was suspended from bridges and, you know, nobody was, uh, blowing anything up. I mean, there was this, there was no property destruction or anything. Um, but it was, um, very telling, I think, when you when you look at those pieces of legislation, those reactive pieces pieces of legislation out there, um, who who supports big oil, who supports corporate welfare over over the people, and um, and you can kind of follow that trail. But so what it did for for the rest of the water fights was it it lit that fire, a fire that was already going, but it really sparked it back up. Mm-hmm. And one of the, the 
spiritual pieces of Standing Rock was um, that we were following, when you came to camp, you know, you had to follow the cultural tr traditions of that place, of the Ocheti Shikoin. And one of their, um, one of the, their things that they did was they lit the, the sacred fire in camp and they always kept that going. And when it was time for camp to close, it was only then that they, they brought that fire down. And the instructions were for us to take that elsewhere, take that to our, our own home fights, you know, where, where the water was being threatened. And so I saw that happen all over the place. It was, it was really neat. All of those, that, that fire went and the embers scattered and, and ignited fires everywhere else. And so when I say fires, I mean fires of the, the heart and spirit, um, you know, not of the, the woods, <laughs> but um, the, uh, so yeah, that, and, and we saw that come out with line three and line five, a lot of those very same uh, water protectors who had, who had been doing those fights, but just at a, um, probably in a smaller capacity, maybe, maybe they weren't being heard as well suddenly got the benefit of um, sort of the general public's eye, you know, that they heard about Standing Rock. And so, oh, and they're do it's happening here too, or, oh, wow, the same type of company is doing the same thing over here. So that nexus and in in that fire was, um, was really heightened for everybody. And, I, and I'm so thankful for that, you know, and, and um, there were a lot of people that were at camp at Standing Rock that were able to take some of the lessons of, of camp to their fights, you know, and, and use it with them. But I think one of the, the other important parts is the, the fact that people did it with um, heart and with a spiritual connection in mind. And, and to me, that, that's what makes it the most successful. Sure. So it sounds like um, social media, Mm -hmm. um, sort of that energy that came from Standing Rock, um, a spiritual connection. Those are some lessons, maybe you use that word lessons um, for the for the efforts here in the Great Lakes. Are there other lessons you think that are important coming out of Standing Rock that you think are applicable to the Great Lakes Basin? Absolutely. I mean, aside from from the the dichotomy of the, you know, corporate um, foreign pipeline, you know, trying to trying to bully states and and tribes to use their water or, or uh, provide passage for their pipelines. Um, I think one of the really cool things at Standing Rock was the the fact that um, at one point almost 50 percent of the camp was was non-native mm. that there was a a lot of support from other people, not just native people, not just indigenous people um, and that was the first time we ever saw that too. You know, not, not that it didn't happen in other places for other movements, but by and large for Native Americans, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's been rare for us to get that kind of support. Mm. And so um, to see them so active as allies in the camp and then to continue that elsewhere, um, that was amazing. And those very same people are out, you know, making strides in their own communities and, and in other fights. So we, we recognize them as, as brothers and sisters in this as well. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up because I wanted to ask you about, you know, in, in, in movements in water protection fights and efforts that are indigenous led, um, what, is, what is the proper perspective or role or stance, someone who's not indigenous can take that's helpful, that's positive, that's, that's you know, a, a good thing to have around in, in those efforts. I think it's really important for everyone to know that it's everyone's responsibility to, to protect the water and to have a, and to make a good relationship with the water. It's everybody's responsibility. Um, but I think when it comes to working with indigenous communities and, and acknowledging that those communities were the original people and have that relationship with the water here, um, that was cultivated over thousands and thousands of years. Um, I think it would be like anywhere else in the in the world. If you have, uh, if you know that there's a a family that's been there doing the same work for all that time and has perfected it, you know, and and has sort of that original connection, um, 
you would show the the proper respect for that and sort of deference to the way that they continue to do that and have continued to do that over the years. So um, I always say it's it's really a, it's a great thing for non-Indigenous people to be really strong allies um, when they come to Indigenous-based um, movements. And um, that means uh, coming in with a very open mind and heart, um, being able to uh, listen, you know, really listen and take in what's being said and, and heard and kind of sitting back and watching for a while too. And sometimes that's really hard for us. <laughs> and I can say that about the European in me because <laughs> I, I have, and, and the attorney in me, I have a tendency to, to see like a situation and kind of see the solution like, okay, here's the fastest and strongest way to get here. And that's like sort of the attorney in me and, and wanting to pare away all the unnecessities and get to the point. And that's not how everybody runs. And, and, and sometimes it's not always the best way to do it either. You know, sometimes we need to take our time and, and take care of some of the ancillary things too. So um, that's a tendency I have. And I always call it, you know, part of my attorney European tendency at a sense of white urgency, you know, to, to take over and, and want to make sure that it's done right, you know, and that's where um, I think an ally needs to to know how to step back a little bit, you know, and say, oh, it might not look right to me right now, but I might not understand that there's a way that this is happening, that it needs to happen that way. Sure. Um, and, um, and just being available. So I think uh, there's a lot of people out there with with different forms of expertise that that we can rely on, and that we can trust. And, um, I think that their their energy and willing to be helpful is really what counts. The and coming in with the right heart, right? So you're you're showing that you're there to give and be part of the whole thing, but you're not necessarily there as an ego play. Sure, sure. Now you're you're the first. I have to tell you, you're the first lawyer and judge I've interviewed for the Great okay. Lakes Spirituality <laughs> Project. So I'm kind of okay. curious how that um, how that background and that training and that experience um affects your perspective on these issues of water and protecting uh our ecosystems i mean does that do you see yourself maybe taking it or not taking a different sort of take on these things i think it i think it gives me a, a broader perspective actually so i i'm i'm probably not the typical attorney you know i started off in it with an arts background and um my degrees were in, in fine art and social science anthropology as an undergrad. So when I came to, to thinking about going to law school, it was really a practical thing for me. It wasn't um, born out of, I wanted to be an attorney my whole life. You know, it was, it was more so like, okay, I see that our community needs some things done. Here are some tools to use that I can use. And so when I started studying the law, which of course is, is really about learning the rules right, and, and how things work in the system. Um, I guess looking at it from an anthropological perspective was what really shaped me because if you, I, I did have the opportunity to, to visit, um, for example, the European Union. I, I studied law in England for a summer and you saw how each country that was part of the European Union um, and how their culture and their belief systems based, um, what was the basis for their law and how their systems worked. And they all had very distinct personalities, like all in this little place. It was amazing. Huh. It's, it's not different from the United States. You know, we, our laws are based on systems of belief, but they're not the same everywhere. Some states are very different from others. Some counties are very different from states. And then you throw in um, my knowledge of tribal law with you know who all have their own cultures and ways of doing things so like each tribe has its own set of laws and so to to be able to see that what what the law kind of teaches you to do is to take a lot of information and pare it down to something to to a simple argument i guess it would be and so that that allowed me to kind of see the humanity in all of this mm. um, which is that through the law, uh, you see that most most people are good people and are are simply trying to um, live comfortably, you know, raise their children or their families and trying to work, and and um, we see that all over the world actually, and it's and it's not anything 
surprising or um, especially uh, extraordinary. It's it's just kind of like generally this is how it is, and the law is a tool that people use to either make that happen or to address when it's being disturbed. So law can be used in a lot of different ways. So when I, as far as the water is concerned, you know, I I had studied some environmental law in college and you know had some ideas of of how that worked, and that helped me to understand. Um, you know, what can we do about it? What does this mean? What are the, what are the acts and um, how, do we, how do we look at different systems of law in relation to the water? Mm -hmm. and, and it was, and then also my experience as a, as a trial judge and a, an attorney, because um, I did both civil and criminal mm. practices, okay. I was able to bring that to Standing Rock. And um, as I was one of the only people there that had experience in both. And so um, I was able to say, alternatively, yes, on a civil rights matter or an issue, you know, you might want to consider these things with respect to the law and the property offsets. You might want to consider these things. And then with respect to somebody getting arrested over here and um, needing jail support or coming up with a, a plea for something, you might want to consider these things. So I had knowledge of all of those things, plus tribal law. <laughs> Wow. And, know, and knowing where to look for those things. So sometimes I think that's the most important tool is knowing where I can access the information I need to help advise in a situation. Wow. So that's, that's what I brought to that. And, and um, I still do that today on, on very many fronts. Well, I like that image of knowing where to look for something, because mm -hmm. I, I think that that's such a key in life that to not have the answer, maybe, but you know where to get an get the answer or who to right. ask. You know. Right, and and that is important. I think it. I think uh, the smartest people know that they don't know everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and and sometimes they have to access people who do know everything about something. You know, or uh, they they have to know to go look for it. So that's um, I always say if you're if you're worth uh, you know your salt in the world of law then you're going to at least afford yourself that um, that room to make mistakes and be human, but also to to continue learning. So, well, that's that's a great I like that little pearl of wisdom, giving yourself room to make mistakes and to keep on living. You just keep on learning. So yeah. I, that's a that's a great place to end our conversation. I, I really appreciate you making the time to talk today, Holly. It's been great. Really enjoyed uh, what you've what you've been sharing. So thank you. Thank you so much. And um, I appreciate what you guys do. We, I know at, at Title Track, we have a huge element of um, working on all of these things. And every single person that who is in our staff or within our, our community there um, also looks at these things with a very spiritual eye, if that makes sense. We're all, we're all from different places and, and some are less um, dogmatic than others, I would say. But um, the underpinning of all of that is love. Yeah. Oh, that's and, great. and I see that echoed in, in all of the work that we do. Yeah. So um, I, well, I, meant, I meant to ask you about title track. So yeah. can you just real, real quick synopsize, synopsize or summarize, I should say, with the work, <laughs> yeah. that, the work that the title track does. So, the, so sure. our listeners and viewers know. Sure. So our, our mission is um, that we utilize creative practice to build um, resilient social eco ecological models within the community that support clean water, that support uh, racial justice and equity and youth empowerment. And so sometimes we, we have programs that utilize some things of that portion, you know, of that mission and, and some utilize all of it, you know. So like I spoke earlier about River Quest where we, um, we took children um, that were victims of the Flint water crisis out into, uh, outside and we introduced them to indigenous teachers wow. to wow. talk about the water and to have some community with the water, um, took them on hikes and canoe rides. And then they would go back to the, the building that we were, um, we were teaching through and write songs about it with Seth and with Chris mm -hmm. Good. And so they, they would create these, um, these thought processes and poetry and songs um, based on that connection and, and their thoughts and what they were learning. 
And then they would create t-shirts and posters to go with it. And every single one of them, they, they had these beautiful songs that they made, um, got to sing them at music festivals that summer. Oh, so there was this sense of not only reviving that connection with the water, but um, showing them that they could do something about it, you know, in a, in a really positive, beautiful way. And then also uplifting their confidence, you know, as to who they were and what, what they loved to do. Um, we've also been doing a lot of the understanding racial justice classes here in Northern Michigan. And um, I always say we're, we're one person at a time trying to move people into a, a space of active anti-racism. And um, that's been really huge here because we've had, you know, here in Northern Michigan, we have a lot of work to do. And we've had a lot of incidents of even recent um, racism that were you, you would have thought we're gone, you know, 30, 40 years ago. So um, that's been great having these five week classes and really um, touching in with people um, as to what this means, what it means for them and, and helping to uncover their unconscious bias, um, helping them to sort of rest and uh, feel the somatic awareness that they have about their in, in their body about racism everybody gets you know their heartbeat goes up whenever we start talking about it and and dealing with that because everybody it harms everyone harms ev everyone that has to deal with it whether you're a perpetrator or a victim or a, a passive stander by and um and helping them to to bring a voice to it and and become um someone who speaks out against it or does something positive to to help make their area more beautiful. So there's there's so many things that we're doing, um, whether, and, and the water, I mean, we have the whole water um, uh, campaign, clean water campaign that we're on and Seth Bernard and I are actively on um, talking with senators, you know, about clean water and, and what that means to us. And they really get a kick out of it because they not many of them have like, you know, musicians. <laughs> who come and sing a song to them about the water as a, as a means of campaigning, you know, or sort of getting them to be aware of an issue. Sure. And so it's, it's impactful, you know, it's, it's pretty neat. Wow. So uh, we do a lot of work and, and um, again, it's, that's based on creating these beloved communities and uh, communities that support, you know, clean water and, and children and racial equity. So well, that sounds like some wonderful work. If if people wanted to find out more about the organization, what's the website? It's uh, titletrackmichigan.org. Okay. And yeah, please come in and see our website. We've got lots of things going on, lots of programming that um, people can take advantage of. And is that is that Michigan spelled out or just MI? Uh, Michigan. Mi titletrackmichigan.org. Okay, yep. great. Well, thanks for all the great work that you've done with Title Track and with out at Standing Rock and here in, in Northern Michigan. It's just really appreciate all that and grateful for, uh, for you making the time to talk today. Thank you so much, Dan. You take care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.